Good morning, everybody. I am back to talk about George Eliot here in the wee hours of the morning. Last night, I was going through this collection of short stories that George Eliot wrote um, and was later collected and published under the title Scenes of Clerical Life. I was going through this last night. This is her uh, earliest published fiction. And as I was going through it, it became obvious, you know, to anybody who reads it really, it becomes really obvious that George Eliot is not interested in writing a fast-paced thriller or a pot-boiler or a, you know, a, a page-turning telenovela or anything like that. Uh, no, <laughs> what she's interested in is writing about experiences of her own life. Uh, this, 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 these stories, her earliest fiction, Adam Bede, Mill on the Floss, uh, Scenes of Clerical Life, all of these have obviously uh, are based on things that she has personally uh, experienced. They're based on people that she really knows. Uh, they're not autobiographies. These are not memoirs. These are stories. That, these are characters that she has invented. But it's stuff that she knows about. These are based on real people. These are based on real experiences. And she's writing about stuff that interests her and it reflects her own <clears throat> lived philosophies. And I think it would be a, uh, useful uh, to go through a little bit of her own personal experiences, a little bit of her early life, see what influenced her, because that's what she's writing about ultimately. So it helps me uh, to understand her fiction better. And it also explains why her uh, fiction, like the best of literature, I guess, uh, transcends the time and place that she's writing in. Uh, you know, after all, I am not the intended audience uh, of George Eliot. She was not writing this to me. <laughs> There's no way. But uh, with that said, I can still relate to it in a certain sense because we shared certain experiences. Uh, I share certain experiences with the author, as lots of us have, I'm sure. So with all that in mind, let's go through a little bit of what her early life was like and what may have influenced her and what went into her fiction uh, eventually. Well, George Eliot was born in 1819 as Mary Ann Evans. And by the way, George Eliot uh, did not exist before she began writing fiction in uh, 1858 or thereabouts. She was about 38 years old when this was published. Uh, you know, she's got a lot of life experience that she can put in these stories. But before this time, she was not George Eliot. Uh, George Eliot didn't exist. She was Mary Ann Evans. So that's what I will call her when I'm talking about her early life. Mary Ann Evans was born, let me see if I can get this straight here, in 1819 in Nuneaton, uh, Warwickshire, England, <laughs> a place I have never been and a place I am sure I have mispronounced. But the bottom line is she was not born into a cultured or sophisticated society. Uh, she was born into a society of people who worked with her, their hands. Her father, Robert Evans, was a carpenter and a land manager. So this was a guy who managed farms, managed property, and he was also a carpenter. George Eliot, in her earlier fiction, wrote about uh, the stuff that she grew up with, the stuff that she experienced. She wrote about carpenters, milkmaids, uh, weavers, coopers, uh, wainwrights, uh, you know, people who worked with their hands. This is who she's writing about carpenters, people like that. Uh, and again, this reflects her, her earlier influences. Let's talk a little bit about her education. Uh, when she was seven, she went to an all-girls school. And then when she was 12, she moved to a private school in a nearby town called Coventry. Now, again, this is back in the days before cars. Not everybody had horses. Coventry turns out to be about 
10, 12 miles from her birthplace. But when you read her letters, that's a long distance away. Uh, um, again, something reflected uh, in the mill on the floss. Uh, Tom Tulliver moves to a private school um, a, a long distance away from her family. How long a distance? 10 or 12 miles, you know, but it was enough to make her family, make Tom Tulliver's family panic. <laughs> so again, this is something that she has experienced in her own life. Um, her education is cut short, though, because her mother died when uh, Marianne Evans turned 16. Her mother died. So Marianne had to move back home to the farm and uh, help dad out. Uh, and became a she became a caregiver for her dad and then helped him out with, as, as a land manager and uh, on the farm, I guess. So from here on, I can't find, by just perusing her, her letters and, you know, what bi biographies I can find of her, I can find really no evidence that she has had any formal education beyond the age of 16. So in other words, everything that she has learned since then is either private instruction, experience, um, influence from neighbors, or, or private education, you know, private tutors. And that's it. Uh, I, she never went to university that I can tell, which is an amazing feat if, if you think about it. Uh, she, after all, had apparently taught herself to um, read and write at least seven languages, it looks like. I mean, Greek, Latin, Italian, German. All of these are either private instruction, paid tutors, or just self-taught through her own reading, uh, which is an amazing feat. Uh, she also became a, an accomplished musician. She was a pianist. Uh, and apparently knocked everybody's socks off. She was very charming by all accounts. Uh, pretty much everybody who met fell in love with this woman. Um, very impressive. Uh, she was, however, by all accounts, a, uh, a nerd. Uh, so on the one hand, she could be very charming. She was very musical, but she was also appeared to have been very withdrawn buried in her books. Uh, she loved to sequester herself away and uh, read. Uh, she was very self-aware. Uh, it appears that her father and herself feared that she may not be married. Uh, she was um, not an attractive, uh, physically, she was not an attractive woman. And uh, she was aware of this, and everybody apparently knew it, and it did concern her, her father. This was a time when, you know, the, 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 the father, the, the male, was the breadwinner, and the, uh, the woman was around to produce children. And, you know, this was just the society they lived in. And uh, so Mary Ann Evans, uh, that, that did concern her, and it concerned her father. Um, she was a nerd, but when she went to the private school in Coventry, it appears she became very religious. So she uh, became a big fan of, for instance, William Paley. We all remember William Paley. He was famous for his natural theologies. Um, so he had arguments like, for instance, uh, you walk down a beach and you see a, a watch. You pick up the watch and you admire the obvious uh, skilled engineering that goes into building that pocket watch. And it reflects the skill of the engineer or the designer of that watch. Well, how much more skilled must the beach be that the watch was found on? Think about the skilled engineering behind the designer of that beach. Well, that's an, that's an example of William Paley's natural theology that he became famous for. And uh, Mary Ann Evans was, uh, was a big fan. She became very religious in her adolescence. Uh, she became a self-professed Calvinist, which is interesting. Um, her father, of course, you know, being from England, was a member of the Anglican Church. And she also had other relatives that were in the new cult of uh, Wesleyanism, 
or otherwise known as the Methodists. Uh, so Marianne uh, became at least temporarily impressed with Calvinism. So when she would go, for instance, to visit her aunt, her aunt was uh, named Elizabeth Evans. She was a Methodist preacher back in the days when women could be preachers in the Methodist church. So Marianne would debate uh, her aunt uh, on the virtues of Calvinism versus the more you know, Methodist version of Arianism that her aunt held. So there are letters that Marianne used to write that related these experiences. So you put all these together. She was a nerd. Uh, she was very bookish, highly intelligent, um, uh, lacking in a formal education, really. She did work in the provinces with her father and also very religious. And then uh, around an atmosphere where the most uh, educated person in town was likely going to be the minister. Again, this is reflected in her earliest novels. Uh, you can see the environment that she's in. Uh, cults uh, in the form of Wesleyanism, Methodism, are, you know, traveling preachers. I don't mean cult in, the, in, the, in a derogative sense, but in a sense of a a religion that features traveling preachers, evangelicalism, which they did call themselves back in those days. Uh, those are prevalent. So this is her adolescence. This is the environment that she was raised in. Okay, so I'm going to end the discussion for the time being. I'm going to end it here. Uh, there's a lot more to say about her early experiences. Um, I've talked a little bit about her provincial background and how the... The, the provinces are reflected in her novels. I've talked a little bit about her education and, and how she was educated, and a little bit about how the characters in her novels are also educated. And so next time, I'm going to talk about more of her religious background and how that shaped not only her philosophy in life, but also her fiction. So I'll talk about that next time. Take care.